Um, so you saw this one image up here, um, and I'm going to, uh, with your consent and participation, make another one right now. That light, the light is great in here. Um, and so an ongoing series just called My Audience, and I'll, I'll say a little bit about it before I make the picture. You guys that are over there are not in the picture. Um, so if you want to be in it, you know, you can get, pull up a chair and get closer. There's, you know, anybody want to be, you can come, come in closer. But otherwise, um, I'm not going to be in it. So don't worry about my instructions. But um, um, I made this, you know, you know, for tax purposes. Uh, <laughs> so that I could say I was doing work. No, I'm just kidding. But I do think that photographers are, and, and, are, and certainly artists are, um, I, there's a term that I, 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 I don't know if I really made it, but I've certainly resurrected it called empliomane. And empliomane is someone that's obsessed with work and working all the time. So, you know, as a teacher, you kind of notice the ones that like to work and those that don't. And I always figure those are the artists, the ones that like to work. So I just wanted to make some work while I was doing these talks. Um, so I started doing this. Also, I was really interested in the idea that um, the pictures are ostensibly a kind of vanity picture, right? Um, uh, except that because I'm using this view camera and the film is rather slow, you all have to hold really still. Uh, the exposure is going to be about three seconds. So what I ask you to do is to pretend that you're at a boring lecture which you are very soon to be at a boring lecture. So it should, it's, 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 uh, it's um, what do we call that? Method acting. So what I would really appreciate is you don't have to smile. You don't have to, you don't have to make funny faces. Just look into the lens. And if anybody's chewing gum, no gum chewing. Um, so, and when I say three, just look into the lens and just pretend that you're at a lecture. You ready? Hold very still. Okay, I'm going to do that again. I really appreciate your, um, you know, just for tax purposes, helping me break this off. Well, still, though, no wiggling back there. That's nice for the camera. And then we can stop talking about the present. It is horrible. I don't like the present. It's embarrassing. <laughs> okay, ready? One more time. I'm real still. Okay, thanks. <coughs> Um, um, yeah, I like I like the fact that my audience, my 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 ostensible vanity project is kind of bored. It looks really bored. So it's a kind of failed vanity project. I like. Um, this is Amherst Books. Some of the same people that are here. This was a poetry reading, which where the audiences are always smaller. <laughs> also, these college gigs, you know, you guys are forced to come here, which, which is always part of the equation, to the boredom factor. Um, this was actually at the same time uh, that uh, Noam Chomsky was talking at the same exact time, so I didn't feel so bad that 12 people showed up on poetry reading. <laughs> poetry reading in um, a beautiful bookstore in Washington, called uh, Bridge Street Books. I, I don't know who that girl is there on the right, but she's kind of cute. <laughs> it's CalArts. They look jaded. <laughs> <laughs> this one features a life-size cutout of Christina Aguilera. <laughs> <laughs> They're, they're, they're doing a Vegas show together. <laughs> Columbia College that graduates 800 photo majors a year and acts
act of terrible irresponsibility. Normally I would face you, uh, but I can't actually see what I'm, it, the, the screen I'm looking at isn't showing you the, uh, what I, so I have to look back at you. This is my best audience ever, I gotta say. Um, so my very earliest memory involves photography. My, my, the very first thing I honestly remember is watching my father and his friends looking at this, uh, these um, cigarette ads, looking for uh, subliminal messages. Uh, <laughs> this one isn't particularly subliminal. <laughs> but so it's the right time period. In. So I've always thought that for me, photography is, a, is something that um, Photographic images are, 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 are things that are, are legible. They're sort of there to be read on some level. They're not just, um, they're not just statements of fact. They have interpretations. So I grew up in this town, uh, town, town and gown issues were, were, were many. Um, and uh, I, you know, we, we knew, uh, you could tell when you got on the free bus what <coughs> college uh, the kids went to instantly. Like especially the girls it was totally obvious. Uh, but anyway, I used to have a job after school, and I would go in between the job to the Jones Library, and I would take photography books into the bathroom and read them in there. Um, and uh, I still have to go to the bathroom every time I walk into that library. Instantly, <laughs> it's like some kind of biological thing has been triggered. <coughs> Let me let me uh, say one quick thing here before it's really weird with these lights. But um, um, if you have any questions, it's kind of better to just yell them out. Don't even have to raise your hand, or if you don't like something I'm saying, uh, <coughs> just say something. Uh, it's, it's better than waiting till there's no images on the screen. Um, That's just a little awkward. scream out. I'm I'm in a, unoffendable. I was just agreeing. I was just saying that's a little awkward because when it gets to the end, and you're like, wait, what was that question exactly? Right, 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 and exactly. You're Hampshire students. You, you know how to think. Um, so the first photographer that really that really meant a lot to me that I used to read these books in the Jones Library were was Harry Callahan, and um, I think that I think that the thing about an image like this made by by Harry Callahan is that I think what it kind of taught me was some kind of faith kind of faith in the in the camera as a as a tool to to um, make meaning in the world. And when you think about this picture, it's a picture of his wife and child. And everything they teach you, you know, everything they teach you in school about photography and certainly about art is, you know, fill up the page and don't back up, don't be afraid to get in close, which is just such hokum. Um, the camera is a, is as good at rendering things that are far away as it is rendering things that are close. And so there's this is to me the greatest image of love ever recorded. And, and, and it has to do with how far away from the subject he got, that he could still feel those feelings and transmit the feelings through the picture, through the camera to you, that, which is of course a metaphysical idea and completely unprovable. But um, it's made more powerful by how far away he got from her. And um, I just remember being really, really moved by that. It's the only thing I have faith in. It's, it's turned out that I have no faith in anything else other than photography, but I do have faith in it, which is very unpopular. Um, this is a picture I made in the Amherst Regional High School uh, photography program. Maybe it's even been junior high. And it um, has certain elements that do show up throughout my entire life. Uh, um, a kind of feeling for, let's say, local light, not natural light exactly, but local light, light that I didn't add, and maybe a certain kind of relationship to text <coughs> and landscape and certain kind of humor. The whole pretty girl thing didn't kind of, never didn't really keep up with that, unfortunately. Um, so I went to college, and um, I just, I chose Bard College because there was a kind of very primitive computer in our, in our guidance office at the Amherst Regional High School. And it was like you had to rub two sticks together and bang it with a rock and then like <laughs> sacrifice a chicken and like a little <laughs> print out of about telling you what colleges you should apply to. And Bard College was on the top of the list. So that was the only school I applied to. Also, I could go there for free because of my mom worked here in Hampshire. So 
Uh, I chose that college. I didn't apply anywhere else. And Stephen Shore was the only professor of photography there at that time, and still is my boss now that I teach there. And it was a real shocker to walk in and having, you know, learned photography and it's this expressive tool, and, and then you show, you show up and this, folks, these pictures are just like pictures of absolutely nothing. And it was really kind of a shock. And, um, uh, you know, um, it took some getting used to. Um, Stephen introduced me to Robert Adams, and, and Adams was the next photographer that I really liked. Um, he, I've always felt like um, there's that, if you got anyone in here know who Anna Richards was? Some of you, they're the older ones, but she was the governor of Texas before George W. Bush. She was a Democrat. And she, at the 19, 88 or 92 Democratic Convention, she said, which one? 88. 88, she said, um, Ginger Rogers did everything Fred Astaire did, only backwards and in high heels. <laughs> and um, I always felt like Robert Adams did everything I ever tried to do, only like 30 years ago, and without any effort at all, seemingly. <laughs> um, while I was in school, there uh, was a show of postmodern photography. Have any, anyone ever heard of postmodernism? <laughs> <laughs> what is it? What is it? But anyway. I'm going to take a guess because I'm never sure, but ironic everything. Ironic everything? I don't know. <laughs> that's, that's how I perceive it. Nobody knows what it is. <laughs> Maybe we didn't even know then, but nobody knows what it is anymore. Well, it was a show of postmodern photography, that's what I can say. And um, at this point, that's all I'm allowed to reveal, um, since you were the uninitiated. But uh, there was work by Cindy Sherman and, and um, other people. And there was a, this work by this guy named Mac Adams. And he had these pictures of kind of scenes of domestic sex and violence that were reflected in household kitchen items. And. Um, you could, go, you could go have a critique with him. And I went and brought my pictures, and everybody was making boring landscapes. It was like the only thing you could do. You're only allowed to do that. And so I took my boring landscapes to him, and he said, well, you know, this one's pretty good, and this one's good, but the rest of them suck. And he said, with me, each picture is just an expression of an idea, and so each one is as good as the next one. And I was like, oh my god, and I ran screaming and crying to Stephen Shore, and I was like, it's just an idea, and he's calmly and with no affect, as he always has said, yeah, but he didn't have any good ideas for 10 years. And I was really struck by the difference between a kind of postmodern practice, which would be to have an idea uh, and execute it. Uh, there are other ideas about the postmodern, but at least in photography, have it relate maybe to the media somehow. Be, a, be a sort of critical vis-a-vis uh, -vis the nature of imagery, and a modern practice, which would be like have a kind of way of seeing and a formal or, or, or ethical vision and go out and make pictures, and then edit them into a book or something. And so I decided that I really needed to kind of like meld these two things somehow. And so I came up with this idea, um, and you know the main text of of, of Postmodernism and art at that time was an essay by Jean Baudrillard called The Precession of Simulacra. Um, and it was about the idea that you kind of couldn't see anything anymore, that everything that you looked at, you had seen images of that thing before. Everything that you had seen, you had already seen an image of. And um, I decided, that seemed a little odd to me, but um, I decided to test out whether it was true on some level. So I walked around with the same exact camera and um, with a big bag of objects, and I would give people objects to look at, and I would photograph their reactions. And I would kind of wait for their eyes to kind of snap into focus. Um, to sort of be able to tell on some level whether they were looking at something or just in the direction of the thing. This is while you were still in college? I was in college, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, 
So that's called wanting attention. And wanting attention is a pun, right? Wanting means both lacking, if you're wanting for something, and desiring it. So I wanted to see it, and I was also in a world where it seemed like people were sort of saying that attention was somehow lacking. He said all that before there was even the internet, which is really shocking to me, right? Because uh, if we're really, if we're really in, in, unable to see anything because of the uh, the intensity of um, images that we've seen before, and, and now we're seeing exponentially more, I think it's been proven wrong. I mean, I think that it turns out that we have an incredible uh, capacity to assimilate image, images and organize them. So. Anyway, I uh, graduated from college and I moved to New York and um, it was kind of like the last recession and the last war in Iraq and the whole other thing. Uh, Bush was president, the other Bush, 41. And um, I stopped making photographs for the most part and I became a writer. It was a lot cheaper uh, to be a poet. You don't need any uh, film cameras, I need a pencil and those can be stolen easily. <laughs> um, <coughs> no pencil, no autograph, kid. Yeah. Um, all the while, and I kind of fell in with a group of writers, and one thing I think you'll all figure out very quickly, um, what college is for is practicing having a community. And you have a community and you learn how to kind of criticize each other, and then when you graduate, then you have a community, and that's how you make art, because you have people to bounce it off of. All of you want to like have an internship and become a professional this and that, that's all bullshit. You should move, when you graduate, get the people whose work you like and move to some weird small town, small city like Austin, Texas, or Milwaukee, and like find a, uh, start a thing and have your own art space, and then eventually the people will come find you. That's my advice, but you didn't ask for it. Um, anyway, I was writing poems and go doing readings and all that, and um, but all the while I did make photographs and I did the thing that people that don't have anything else to say do, which is I made self-portraits. Um, and I I started out by with a series of pictures in the movie theater. I've always loved the cinema, and I I used to go to the Amherst Cinema when it was just a revival house. It was a big, giant, one-screen, huge movie decaying movie palace and I would go to two, three times a week and watch double features and I learned a lot. Um, so this was like, I would take a picture of the screen and then I would turn the camera on myself and make a, uh, this is just a 35 millimeter camera, a uh, double exposure of myself. And this is from Hermano Olmi's Il Costo, which is one of the all time, my all time favorite films. Um, you know, I did just things that people do, double exposures, it was fun. You know, travel <laughs> photography. <laughs> Sorry? Uh, anyway. <laughs> well, let's not get too, uh, oh, too close over there. There's a piece of rated talk. Um, I had a job in an office. I, I worked uh, as an editor at a publishing company. I started as the um, phone answering <coughs> girl. <laughs> I just uh, talked to a friend of mine who I forgot, reminded me of the story the very first day. This is really wasting time. This is a story that is not related, and I'm going to censor myself. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, anyway, I picked up the phone, and I said, I got two calls at the same time. Please hold, and I went to the other person, and then when I came back, the voice said, this is Harvey Weinstein. Do you know who I am? <laughs> Harvey Weinstein of Miramax, which is, you'll put me on hold. Do you know who I am? What's your name? What's your name? Tell me, show me. And I was like, I'm really sorry, Mr. Weinstein. I had no idea. It's my first day. I really didn't. Anyway, it was my friend. <laughs> <laughs> I eventually moved up the ladder. Um, but I hated this job. Even though it was a great job for a poet, I sat and read all day. But I really hated it. And um, I started <laughs> noticing things in the office that kind of moved me, and they started out with these kind of reflections. Um, uh, we've got the obligatory Ansel Adams calendar there. And that great uh, Macintosh with like 128K of memory. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I, I started photographing after hours. Um, at first, these kind of reflective things, which just seems like a completely clear psychological read of like wanting to get out of there. <laughs> and then also just things, details of things that just seemed meaningful to me. And I thought about it as a kind of 
reclamation project. Like here I am stuck in this office with eight people working there. I mean, it's like an Art Deco office on 19th, the 19th floor of an old building on 14th Street. So it was great. I mean, everything about it was great. It was very romantic in a lot of ways. Uh, just that kind of icky romantic that means you're actually bored out of the mind. Um, and so I, it was a very interesting thing to think about photography in this way. And what I kind of realized as I was doing it um, was that I, uh, I, I, the attention that I was looking for in those other people, I had kind of put into myself. So I, originally I tried to photograph people really looking at something. And so then I realized halfway through this that I was just really trying to look at the things that were immediately around, around me and make them kind of mean something. Um, so uh, that summer after, I think this is, I, I, I can't really use uh, that summer since I haven't described which summer it is, but this is summer after I quit this job. Um, my uh, grandmother had a stroke. I was very attached to my grandmother. I spent a lot of time with her in the hospital. That led me to make uh, this next project, which was um, the same, same kind of process only in a hospital. Um, just. Uh, you know, moving through an architectural space that has a certain kind of intention, right? Architecture is put there to control you, to make you move a certain way, to make you see a certain way, to make you experience the world a certain way. And I was just interested in fucking with that. Mm -hmm. Just like everything that was kind of wrong with it or, you know, so these files move back and forth like this. They have a big crank and they move the files and it would draw that nice drawing on the wall. You know, I uh, no, these are all with the four by five oh, again. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, I found that if I went, you know, late at night, nobody cared. Like I had to get permission to be in the hospital in the first place. But they said I had to tell every room I was going to be in and sign a form. But I found if I went like at eleven o'clock at night, nobody gave a shit, and it was just like free reign. <coughs> So, you know, I kind of posited myself as this guy who this was going to be my work. It was going to be like working against the architecture, working against the purposes of a place. And I always liked the idea that there, an artist sort of needed to be um, outside of the dominant system. Like, you know, um, this doesn't mean that when Robert tells you to do something, you should do it. Um, don't get me wrong. But, um, and so I kept moving from project to project. This is a, I, 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 I chose parking lots. So this is a project called Lots. Um, and I started photographing at night um, in these parking lots and just uh, that would for me also had a kind of pun involved in it, right? So lots are parking lots, but they're also lots. There's lots, there's lots there to look at, even though it doesn't sort of seem like there might be at first. Um, and I really love this light. I had never used this kind of light before. Um, so I went from that project being natural, outdoor, the first project you look, looked at was like light, outdoor, natural light during the day, then indoor, natural light, then indoor, artificial light, and now outdoor, artificial light. And this was work that I really began to think of it as a kind of sculpture garden. Like I just realized that if you pretend you're in a sculpture garden, everything starts to look really interesting. And this is behind the Denny's in uh, Florida. Was there like that? Yeah, it was just sitting there. Just sitting there. Florida. Everyone sleeps standing up. <laughs> and in California, everybody swims to work. I forget. So there are lots of pictures, images in these projects, so I'm just kind of running through them as quickly as I can. Um, I decided my next phase would be inside big box stores, and I, 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 it was impossible. It was impossible to get permission. And, um, but you know when you go to Home Depot, it takes half an hour for anybody to help you? Yeah. I found I could go in there for half an hour with a tripod and the full view camera and everything before I got kicked out. But I didn't like working under that kind of pressure. And so this was actually, I got kicked out of that building as a super Kmart. I walked around the neighborhood. It was kind of an interesting, warm, late autumn night. And I saw this house that had light kind of reflected off of, uh, from the super Kmart. I took that picture. And then across the street from it, there was this other house that had this reflection from a gas station. There were four gas stations on the corner. Um, and and I, I took a picture of it. And it was one of those real photographic moments of, like, I don't know if this is going to work, but I'll just do it. And so that led to a kind of series of pictures called Retail. 
um, which are pictures of um, houses made at night that have reflections of like global corporate entities in the window. What? That is just like one of those moments that was just perfect. Yeah. It felt that way to me too. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a, it was very interesting for a lot of reasons. I mean, um, from the kind of uh, essential reason of why you would make art, because it was like very complicated for me. I, I mean, I I knew that I hated this. I hated that these kind of pretty old houses were, you know, surrounded had been surrounded by this growth and car culture and global court you know there'd probably been like a little a little milkman shop <laughs> next door and eventually <laughs> became a, uh, you know eventually became McDonald's and um but I also knew that the actual images were kind of like the most beautiful things I had photographed like there was just something about the actual quality of those reflections that was like I mean I thought I said in, a, in an essay that was like the illuminated capitals of medieval manuscripts like there was just something very beautiful about them mm -hmm. so there was this really complicated feeling like I kind of hated it politically and I kind of loved it visually and I thought well I must be doing something right. Um, other thing about them was that you could only see it from one vantage point. That was a really weird thing. Like if you moved your head like that or like that, you couldn't see it. And so it constricted me in a lot of ways and there were a lot of places where there was kind of a good situation. Like there's a grill, there's like a KFC over there and there's a house over there. But there was kind of no picture there because I was really forced to be in one spot. You know, if now with digital stuff, it would be really easy to fake. Um, I lived in New York all this time. I lived in the Lower East Side, and I watched it go from being an interesting place where artists live to being a gated community for rich people. And I really hated it. I really hated it. And there was a thing I called the charm removal service. <laughs> Would come in and like your favorite weird junky bar, <laughs> crazy cafe, and then the next day it would be like a Starbucks. And I'd be like, what? When they just came in the night. <laughs> so I decided, I was always telling students, like, don't go to New York. You know, just stay in New Haven. It's better. It's not so New York. And so then, <coughs> the summer of 2001, I decided, well, I, you know, I, I'm this photographer that thinks I can kind of find something interesting to say about anything. So why don't I try to photograph in New York? So I put the camera in a shopping cart. You can find shopping carts anywhere. And um, I'll get it. <laughs> no one says that anymore. <laughs> uh, it would be a great way to like meet somebody. And, Stick your hand in their pocket. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, um, so I decided to photograph New York. So I spent uh, the summer of 2001 pushing my camera around in a, in a shopping cart, kind of looking for evidence of that older New York or that, not, trying not to be nostalgic about it though. I didn't want to go to like, I didn't want it to be like a Tom Waits song. Um, I just wanted to find evidence of things that were kind of like a little bit more, you know, uh, rough and tumble and also just pictures that just felt like the place wasn't just becoming a, you know, New Jersey somehow. <laughs> um, and I actually made, by the way, New Jersey, the most interesting <coughs> state in the country. Yeah. The most, uh, the most densely populated, more densely populated than India. Yeah. Overall, <laughs> India has some big empty places and it's big. But anyway, this picture was made on the night of September 10th, 2001, and I took the picture. This guy is smoking a joint and waiting out the rain in this area where they're like um, pulling up, they're turning this old riverfront area into a park because everything will eventually be a park and a museum. <laughs> and that's when I'm getting on the spaceship. Anyway. <laughs> New Spaceship Museum. Um, and uh, then I like put on an Elvis costume and went to my um, girlfriend's sister's birthday party. And the next morning I woke up and the work had totally changed meaning. It went from being like critical and, and sort of like ne quite negative about New York to being the sort of elegiac pictures of rubble and junk. And it was really shocking to like, wake up and find that, you know, um, whoever it was, the U.S. government had 
uh, would ruin my, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, uh, wouldn't it be great if I just went on like a crazy <laughs> So that was kind of fascinating, and, and I was really kind of stuck what to do, and I felt like I couldn't make the work anymore. So I, I decided, well, religion is the problem here. Um, I'll make some pictures that kind of make it look kind of bad, and I started photographing um, religious stuff that I you know, that kind of looked kind of bad. Did you assemble any of this? No. Um, this is this kind of corporate Jesus uh, and this uh, Mormon <laughs> temple in Phoenix. Uh, like, boardroom Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> got it on, like, touch screen thing. <laughs> Touch one for transubstantiation. <laughs> <laughs> I was non-denominational in my criticism. Is this the found light? Though? This is all found. I've never used a light uh -huh. in my life. My students are always like, can we learn about lighting? I go, sure. Just somebody else's class. <laughs> I don't know how to do it. <laughs> um, I found that work to be a little like too mean-spirited and one way, and so um, at the, one day I made this picture, I didn't know why I made it, and that's actually my grandmother's collection of kind of like left-wing political buttons. Um, they're a little hard to read here, but, um, um, and then we've got everything from like Cesar Chavez and Angelo Davis, and so like Mondale, Ferraro button. And um, it sits on a wall that my grandfather painted this mural. He's actually a fantastic painter. Um, and I took this picture, I didn't know why I took it, I just did it. I was interested in the way it looked, and I took it. And then I went to LA, and I, um, just for January break, and I put my camera on a shopping cart, and in LA I really looked crazy, um, pushing it around. <laughs> and I just went out to take pictures, and I saw this uh, protest is outside of an abortion clinic, and these guys have actually been hired by this guy on the right. Um, and so I made this picture, and I immediately kind of knew that I had a project, and it was going to be called My Life in Politics, and it was going to be the same sort of ostensible approach, like sort of go into the political landscape and kind of look at stuff that I find interesting. So you did it with a four-by-five yeah. camera, and nobody's looking at you. Well, I stand there for a long time. They're busy <laughs> also. <laughs> like, they're doing something. But I, I, I set it up, and I just stood there for half an hour until I got that moment, and nobody was looking at me. Anyone who you were homeless? <laughs> well, kind of was. I got there actually, and my friend who was going to put me up was not there. I was kind of homeless, actually. What does the sign say? Jesus is the way. Uh, I can't see. Uh, can't see. The way. The way. It's the true. The truth. The, 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 the light. Jesus is the wind, the river, and the tea. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that means. Um, so then I kind of proceeded with the project in a kind of two-pronged approach. Uh, one prong involved going to self-definedly political places and kind of doing what I had done in the office, in the hospital, in the parking lots, like just looking for anything interesting. And so this was at a communist summer camp. And these were like, they were showing me the videos that they had shot of their kind of like mock protests that they did. So they like, <laughs> they divided up into four groups every every summer. And this summer was like the Afghan Women's League, the Hollywood 10, and like two other ones. And then they like played ultimate frisbee against each other and also like had protests and stuff. <laughs> Um, and then just, you know, noticing the way <coughs> politics kind of sprung up in the landscape. And this was actually after a John Kerry rally where he didn't show up and, and in New York. And I just saw these girls at this, you know, um, ATM machine. Um, this was a big show, a really big show in New York. And um, I produced a newspaper. I loved the idea of everybody walking around this big show and, like, actually just reading a newspaper. <coughs> um, and so each... Each um, image had a caption in the newspaper, so I'll read you some of them. And they're poems, they're not really proper captions. Um, may we describe the look in her eyes? If there weren't rock and roll, maybe no. But fuck you, I love you's here to stay. As long as there are ATMs to rage and lean against, and candy apple hair dye at every corner deli. Rage light, people for against, people against for. The right likes it frictionless. The left likes it glowy. Open your eyes and tell me a story. <coughs> um, 
Yeah, the work that um, really inspired me on this project was Walker Evans American Photographs, which you saw those bums holding under that bridge. Um, and, uh, you know, the politics in, in, in Evans about, you know, he was hired by the FSA, uh, you know, hired all these artists during the Depression, just like Obama was going to do. Hire, he's going to hire all the artists that are out of work to document the American scene. Uh, I guess that's probably not going to happen. But uh, anyway, uh, and, and Evans was like, couldn't really handle it. He was too interesting. Like, he couldn't make propaganda. He was too complicated in a way. Evans had this way of kind of sneaking the politics into the work without it being propaganda. If you look at the other FSA photographers, um, if you compare, uh, Hampshire College was a very interesting school it's in New Hampshire, uh, which is the Granite State. Live for your dad. Live for your dad. Thank you very much. <laughs> Should we just, uh, what, what do I do? <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? Anything about any subject, even your own personal lives, <laughs> can help you can answer your questions. Could you try and articulate what your criteria was for what you chose as a subject in the, you know, the previous four series that you just talked about? Um, Are you doing that or am I doing it? What were my criteria for subject? Like, I mean, it's got to be more than something like just interesting. You know, what what were you oh, yeah. looking for? That's a good question. Thank you. Do you think that I like lingered too long or something? Or maybe that computer has to be like touched every once in a while so it doesn't go off? Try to. Uh, yeah. Um, I had a really interesting experience last summer. Uh, two summers ago, where I was uh, asked to photograph Barack Obama while he was um, running for office, and I, I could show you the picture maybe at some point after it, but um, maybe it would be better for me to illustrate that with the image, and I can tell the whole story, because as I was doing it, I had 10 minutes to photograph him, and I hadn't seen the place beforehand, and I kind of, as I was doing it, I was like, this is a lesson in how one makes a picture. Everything about this, the pressure is so high, and every decision I make seems really important. So I like I like made a little mental uh, image, you know, screen grab of what I was doing. So I, could, I probably can find that image on the internet. Is this computer hooked up to the internet? So anyway, you can kind of see in here like certain the pol political messages are often like in between the images. In Evans, I'll go back to my own. So it was a lot of driving around the country, and um, I'll read you this caption too. Uh, Xena warrior princess looks like Bill Clinton's mom, <laughs> as do some of the women he loves. <laughs> and in Sunset Boulevard t-shirt shops, I've come to play Pompeii. Herculaneum, insists Xena. Okay. Meanwhile, the wrist is voted most erotic axis as Buffy and John Kennedy share a yes, explicable encounter. <laughs> the figures at right are Mao and Mata Hari. Did you write the poem? Yeah, I wrote them. Yeah. I wrote them. Oh, okay. uh, this is the Madonna of the right. <laughs> this is the Madonna of the left. <laughs> <laughs> They're exactly the same woman. Genetically, <laughs> exactly the same, but like at some event in their lives peeled them off so that she's at like a Memorial Day rally in uh, a military base in outside of St. Louis, and she's like at a pro-Palestinian rally in D.C. Uh, this is a. Um, a replica of the Oval Office. Um, and so that's actually a photograph of the view from the Oval Office. <laughs> and it's kind of turning cyan. Like, like this is a Duratrans and the cyan dyes older, like your Chinese restaurant menu images that turn cyan. <laughs> These are two lobbyists. 
I always think of them as the Coke and Pepsi lobbyists. I did a little mini series called Founding Father's Crotches. <laughs> and this collector named Norman Dubrow was this crazy old queen, and he was like, that's Thomas Jefferson, that's <laughs> and I was like, Norman, did you sleep with these people? <laughs> I know you're old. I always thought this one is like the perfect symbol of America. It's like a, it's like a distorted blood red stain used to cover over a failed business venture. <laughs> a few blocks from where Nelly grew up. That's a painted crack on the uh, living room. <laughs> There's a nice odd in Where is this? Where are you? I don't remember. <laughs> Also, it was run by Chinese or Koreans <laughs> in so South Central LA. Uh, this is the Connecticut Senate floor during a filibuster. And there's a guy off camera, like talking the whole time, and everyone else is out smoking a cigarette. <laughs> that blue thing is the budget, that big, tall thing. Find out later. Uh, this is an anti flag burning rally. <laughs> of which only the uh, media has showed up. Um, there also was an ocelot, but I didn't get the ocelot in the picture. <laughs> I'm trying desperately not to televise the Not spelling it right either. <laughs> So at one point in this project, I made this picture actually in the Massachusetts State House, and this is just like a picture of some gov old governor. And if, as I looked at the picture from a certain angle, um, I noticed that you could sort of see this underpainting, like the paint painter had started over a couple times, and so I had this kind of art historical reference. And I just like that it made him look kind of gross and ugly and distorted. Um, but that led me to a whole other series of pictures called uh, Permanent Collection. And so what I did was I went into museums and photographed paintings also from a slight angle. So that light that was from the museum itself would bounce off the surface of the painting and reflect and kind of change the meaning of the painting. And I used that same view camera so you can run the focus along the surface even when you're shooting at an angle. I really like the idea that light was something that could serve to, not just to illuminate, but to like erase. That seemed like kind of interesting. I said Worcester. The Worcester Museum, which is a really cool museum. I spent a lot of time in museums, and uh, there's very odd cultures. Every museum has a completely different culture, which I had to navigate. I couldn't do this without permission, obviously. I had to, I had to have permission. And so I'm an Aikens painting of rower, completely obliterated that the light. Again, I felt like uh, I was working against the architecture in a similar way, right? The museum hangs the painting and lights them in certain ways so that they look like an image. But we all know that a painting isn't an image. I mean, anyone, I'm married to a painter, but uh, so I actually know that a painting is not just an image, it's actually a monster that controls my whole life. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's a four-dimensional thing. Yeah. Uh, I feel like I'm married to a paint, a painting, rather than a painter, because however her painting is going, that's how happy she is. Yeah, nothing to do with that. Um, this was funny. This was in a show. In, I had a show of this work at the Knoxville, the so-called Knoxville Museum of Art, and um, this picture wasn't there when I got there, but then I noticed that there was like a weird wall about this high, like sort of right here, like three quarters of the way through the gallery, and I was, you had to go like behind it to look at it. And I was like, it's Corvée, but not in the south. I guess it's not Corvée, it's Pousset. <laughs> um, that led to this series. Um, I called ill illumination. So I got really interested in this using light actually as the kind of tool against the architecture. 
And so I decided to make a, a much wider bandwidth project um, called Ill Illuminations, which nobody understood that it was called Ill Illuminations. Every review referred to it as Illumination, which just blew my mind. Um, but um, this was, yeah, so I felt like I've often worked in a very narrow bandwidth of attention, like, okay, I'm looking at a reflection of a corporate sign in a house. And then I'll work in wider bandwidths like this, which is sort of like take a kind of functionality of, of or like an interface with the world. Like how is light working wrong, or how is it <coughs> overwrought, or how is it failing, and, uh, how is it over uh, overdetermined. Um, and I really love that. I love working that way. I, I feel more like a poet working this way, <coughs> bringing together sort of disparate images. The art world doesn't like it this way, though. The art world likes it to be eight of the same thing <coughs> that you can, the collectors know which are the good ones, and the, uh, the press can go in there and you know identify what it's about so they can get on to the next thing. I don't like it complicated. I liked how the stripes were like going off into the ceiling. Seven eleven. Mm -hmm. This one is uh, flashes. You can see it's actually a long exposure and it's at dusk. And there are all these flashes going off of people taking pictures of the sunset. I love the idea that it's from our roof of our old studio. And um, I love the idea that like the flashes weren't lighting anything up. Let me skip over this for the sake of time. Uh, this is a, the idea of uh, uh, antiquity and what it means in photography, but I don't feel like I have enough time to talk about that. Um, so I went to Rome 2008 uh, and lived in Rome for a year and didn't really know what to do there. I, I've always felt like the most kind of American photographer possible in that, especially in this attitude of like kind of wanting to criticize everything and wanting everything to be kind of the wrong way around. Also, I've always felt like the camera is this incredibly like uncritical tool. Like the camera just loves anything you put in front of it. It doesn't give a shit what it is. It doesn't care if it's like, you know, Penelope Cruz or a dog turd. Like it just sees the same thing as long as there's enough light on it. And um, so I've always felt like the photographer has to be criti the critic. And it, I, I always felt like, oh, it's really weird to do that in a landscape that isn't your own. Because you make all kinds of assumptions. Do you have a question? Yeah, I was just wondering, you obviously travel a lot. Do you, are you usually traveling to photograph, or are you just going to these places and then a series of those? Um, that's a good question. Um, it's both. I mean, sometimes I'm setting out with a the main thing is that I almost never start out with an idea. I always start out with something I've observed and then think, you know, sometimes it takes two pictures to go, aha, wow, that's an idea. I'm really interested in this idea that we think of thought as being, uh, it has this, very, it's like this kind of like your Erasmus and you're like sitting in a, in, a, in a room. It has to happen in this cloistered place. And thought, of course, is not a cloistered thing. And for me, the thought often happens in the field. It happens like, oh my god, that's really interesting. If I put that together, then it's like a door that opens and I can go work on that. And then I will travel for the work a lot. I'll just drive around. I mean, my life politics is all over the country. and um, You know, I do like a job. Like, I'm doing a job for Time Magazine on spring break in Washington. And I'm going to like just go off and see what happens for it the rest of the week. Um, but this was like I applied for the Rome Prize. I got the Rome Prize. I had an idea, but it totally didn't work for reasons I can go into. Mostly has to do with the fact that not, you can't do anything in Italy if it involves anybody else or any Italians. If any are Italians are involved, nothing will ever happen. You have coffee, and you sit around, you have to know somebody's brother, and I was like, this is never going to work. So I started going out to the edges of the city. Uh, one other thing was I just felt very uncomfortable being in this ancient place. I actually was a classics major for a while in college, and until the point came where I was like, I have to have something to say about this stuff that's been, people have been talking about this for 2,500 years. How am I going to have anything to say? And so I felt like if I go to the suburbs, it's more like New Jersey there, you know, it's kind of the, it's the suburbs is kind of a globalized place. It's sort of similar everywhere. 
and I felt much more at home. Um, and so this is actually <laughs> this uh, golf course that's near this, you know, it has this fantastic um, aqueduct, but it's out in the suburbs, and that kind of led me to make this book, uh, uh, oops, uh, this project called My Life in Politics, I'm sorry, The New Antiquity. So I decided that, you know, if you're, if you, when we got to Rome, they're always bringing you to these ancient temples and you're looking like a, at a pile of rocks and it looks like a pile of rocks. And then someone goes, well, this used to be the temple of so-and-so. And then you go, ooh, you <laughs> see it differently. And so I was really interested, can I apply that same kind of attention to other stuff that isn't so great and ancient? So, you know, like, this is in a carrozzeria, in a, like a, car mechanic place. And the guy just like took all the oil filter things and like stuck them on the wall and come use one. And I was like, you're an artist. Say <laughs> artista. <laughs> and I have to admit that like part of the joy of this was just like feeling like so not Italian. Like just so not doing everything wrong. Like they're so they're so good in, in Italy at like living the way they're supposed to live and they have a good life, and it's kind of life's kind of easy, and as long as you're not a minority, <laughs> um, that's great. As long as you're not a gypsy, it's great. But uh, anyway, I loved being like looking at everything the wrong way, and oh, I felt so happy. Um, so I would just literally like get on the bus and like go to the end of the line and get out and walk around with this big camera and just look for stuff that kind of gave me that same feeling. Some of it quite logical, like there's a sphinx, only it's like a sphinx from 1930. Um, so just like, this is like in a gypsy encampment. And I was actually taking this picture, didn't know the cat was in there, and then cat came out. Uh, this is outside of Rome. This is one I, I, just, I got asked by an art magazine in Italy to talk about my favorite place in Rome. I talked about this motel room around. <laughs> <laughs> Norm, that I, it was just in a show in Rome last week, a week and a half ago. No one believed me that it was in Rome. I was like, it's Via Reza. No. I was very interested in the immigrant cultures, and there's a lot of images of kind of immigrants. And, um, this is like a snapshot that I found in Ditch, a book of snapshots that was all about it. This is just like this place where they were making this stuff, and this was like out behind it in the like dump area. And this was an image of an actual Quattrocento fresco that had just been, had like 500 years of graffiti. So I was kind of interested in this idea of like flux of history, the history changing. Um, as I as I was making this work, I started looking back at other work I had done before, and I actually had done this work in China. And this is a, from a wooden toy factory in China. And uh, I just really, I, it was actually this picture that made me realize, like, I can start to put these pictures together. And, I, and so these are, so intermingled in here now are pictures from China and Italy, all of which kind of to me are like, is this an archaeological site? But basically it's giving me, like, this is a statue of pants. <laughs> <laughs> best statue in the world. <laughs> best work of art. <laughs> and then I started building back in some of these New York pictures, too, that had never had a home. Pictures that just felt like, you know, is this some kind of archaeological site? And it's, kind of big. it's really just a traffic jam on the FDR Drive. <laughs> they had lost their marbles. Um, I did include some people um, in this, and to me they were people that just didn't seem to exist in a particular time. They seemed to like be fluid. Um, it was like they looked like they're on an Etruscan base. It's outside of Rome. It's, there's just all the country lanes outside of the ring road in Rome are just they're prostitutes. <laughs> and as you get like further and further out, they get darker and darker skin, so they're like African. I don't know what these girls are, or if they're really girls or what the story is. They were really excited to get the picture taken up. Maybe I shouldn't use the word excited. Um, <laughs> this guy, Hugh Pasolini, 
because Pasolini had cruised for boys around his shop. Back in the there are pictures I like could consider red herrings, like a thing that looks like this might be some kind of sight, but it's really just nothing. This is a town in China where they make uh, Christmas decorations. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Is that the cart you used to push the camera to? <laughs> yeah. This was uh, right near the airport. And I figured that these guys like made this for the, it was on Christmas Day that I photographed this. And I figured that these guys like rearranged these big giant logs so the boss or whatever you see. <coughs> so the idea of the fragments. Italy, southern Italy is filled with these houses that you can't tell whether they're a ruin or under construction. They're called abusivi, and they're just like built. They just illegally put up the structure, and then they wait, sometimes it's 10, sometimes it's 20 years, for the government to be like, all right, go ahead. <laughs> so I love that in terms of the light, in the light of kind of like, is this ancient or new? Um, I also uh, did other projects there. I, I, I did this project called the um, Photography Liberation Front, um, which uh, I stole you know, photography signs from <laughs> churches and museums. I have like a hundred of them now. If you ever find one, get it to me. I'd be really pleased. I have an army of people that have attended my lectures now bringing the photography signs from all corners of the globe. I love the like carefulness which was like the nuns, you know, like the nuns of this abbey like downloaded that picture off the internet, printed it out on that laser jet and <laughs> laminated it. <laughs> I don't have the video because I couldn't show this from my laptop, but this is a video called um, European Vacation, and it's a thousand images of spastikas, and they show for a third of a second and on walls, and they just like rotate really, really quickly, but I can't really show it. Um, I got very interested in the idea of, uh, one of the things that that, that that year of sort of having nothing else to do um, really uh, um, did for me was it really loosened me up and got me less fixated on making a particular project. And so the last thing I'm going to show you is a new, uh, something new, uh, which is a video. Um, and, uh, and it's, you know, it's uh, going to be a big, a big thing. And, what I'm doing is I'm kind of going out in the landscape and I'm sort of uh, finding things and <laughs> making new sports out of them. It's called the shotgun shell uh, biathlon. <laughs> you all crawling through shotgun shells and covering all your hands, all your fingers with them, which is hard after like the seventh or eighth minute.
partly came about because I um, <laughs> I had like sprained my ankle playing open with frisbee, and I was like really bummed out that I couldn't play any real sports. So I started after it healed up a bit. That was actually why I didn't go any higher on this one because I was scared that if it fell, I'd smash my body. <laughs> <laughs> this is the uh, rotten vegetable uh, freestyle. <laughs> 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 He had his arm one quarter of an inch low. No good. No good. No good. This is called the um, polyphonic uh, mo um, polyphonic motet shadowbox. And there's no special effects on this with the audio. Your father, your father, 
was a lighter. And you were a match. You are nothing. Your uncles, your cousins, they're worthless. They're nothing. They're genie. I smack you down. I smack you down. You got nothing. You got nothing. You got less than nothing. You are barely flammable. You are barely inflammable. You are nothing, babe. I'm going to take you down to where the earth is green, to where the water flows. You are quiet. You are cold. You are merely a line in the sand. <laughs> So maybe we should uh, turn off the sound, and uh, I'll answer questions now. We can just let this run in the background for a while, because it's kind of long. So thank you very much. the world, and that is the problem with photography or something like that. And I was like, that's like saying, meals are tasty and nutritious, that is the problem with food. <laughs> you know, I just feel like, um, I feel like, uh, I don't know, there's all this weird anxiety about the nature of photography to describe the world, and I, I just feel like it's missing the whole point. Like, the, 
that there's like a bottomless amount of, of significance and meaning, even if it's comedic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, even you know, I don't think like significance is a thing that's limited to stuff that's about that. <laughs> 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 I chose the small the babies, the dead babies to jump over. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, the second and third part of what I heard speak about work of their Oh, really? That's amazing. And, That's so cool. um, there's something like, really startling about how all of a sudden how little control you have over your like, mm -hmm. like, how did that, how did it change for you? Like, it was kind of like, like a disturbing and unlike that. It's taken me ten years to get lots of big other examples of that, not just 9-11, but like, I don't know, let's say you were making a project about your boyfriend and like, then he died. You know, the work would mean something totally different. Even if like the pictures were all the same, like a Groucho nose, you know, like playing a zipper. <laughs> Suddenly it would mean something very different. What's the name of this event? Oh, this is 13 ways of looking at a dead black person. <laughs> 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 I'm a bad, I've always been a bad actor. Really? It seems like that might be something you could do. Especially with the fire scene. What? Any other questions? A good question. Yeah. How come there are only two people that you come here to poetry? Well, the, all the images from my life in politics have uh, poems, but I just didn't oh. think I could read all of them. <laughs> oh, okay. Everybody hates poetry. Yeah. Oh. Not in Latin America or in Russia, they like it. But... You know, 
honestly, I didn't really show you like the last project in here, which is shot with a digital camera. So I got this digital camera, and I sort of figured like I might as well see what happens. And uh, I made this project in it. And um, I think that's the end of this. Um, and uh, the um, the digital camera just has like uh, you can turn the lights on. <coughs> Um, it has, you know, this camera has this incredible video capacity, and I kept noticing, like, I don't like these photographs at all, but I really like the video, so that led to the video project. And then the other thing is, like, I don't think my work is very personal, um, and I'm really interested in that. I'm, I'm always, like, I'm sort of thinking, like, I don't think my work is personal, exactly. And I'm, I'm trying to make it more personal. So one way I thought was, like, make something around me. I live up in the country in upstate New York. I love it there. And I just sort of really like want to make something about it. And so I thought a lot about how to do it. And this was what ended up going on. Also, I like I, I was like, the work isn't always connected with my life in so in so many ways. Like it feels like a real separate thing. In the same way that like religion would be a separate thing. Like when I'm out photographing, it feels like I'm a completely different person. So I just I'm always like, yeah, I love sports and all I really if I had a choice between playing sports and like making art, I would probably choose sports. So why not find a way to combine them? It's just efficiency. I'm, I'm actually really interested in that. In, in school, I'm, in, I'm always talking about efficiency. Like somebody does a photo project for a week and they make like four examples of like the same thing. And I'm always like, well, if you had just done four like slightly different variations on it, then it would even look like you did a lot more work, even though you didn't. That's just efficient. <laughs> <laughs> um, how do you, or do you, do you approach the image differently if it's moving or still in terms of like your aesthetics or just I don't know your when you're thinking of making a video versus a photograph. What's uh, the difference? Yeah, I mean it's awesome. <laughs> you get this X, uh, the Z axis, mm -hmm. and you get this way much more than you do in photography. I mean we do have the Z axis in photography. Um, that's an interesting question. I don't really know yet. I'm just kind of figuring out how to do it. And also I'm using this video camera that you know this. By this Canon that has this long skinny frame that I haven't used for a long time. I have to figure out how to make pictures with that shape. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, do you ever talk about all these different bodies of work kind of in sections? Do you ever find yourself you know, when you're doing one body of work thinking about a past one? Or do you ever find yourself? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I, I feel like I'm not a very good artist. On some level, like I think I'm a really good photographer, and the art part of it, where I'm like, I know for certain what this work is. That thing I'm always like, I don't really, I don't really mind. I really don't mind if it doesn't really find a final form. You know, like I have books and I have exhibitions, and but but the reality is like I'm I, I'm one of these people that just really wants to make it more, and I, I I've gotten to this weird point now where I'm like. I don't really care if anybody sees it, which is a little disturbing. But that, I think being a photographer means that because you already are used to 98% of the things you make nobody ever see. Um, so I don't know, it's complicated. That's a complicated question. I, I do think the bodies of work are, I remember I, when I was in graduate school, I met with Thomas Demand, who's like a really amazing photographer, some of you know him, who builds sets out of, uh, like recreates photographs out of construction paper really elaborately to scale and then re-photograph them. And he was like, you shouldn't have a body of work. You should just have one of these and one of these. And, one of these. <laughs> and I realized like there's a lot of good reasons for that. One of which is just like marketing. Like <laughs> um, the fewer images you make, the more valuable they are. Um, and I feel, like, at some level, like a very traditional photographer. Like I really want to go out and exhaust something. And I know in that no matter how much uh, I'm doing a lot of work that's more in the studio right now, but I know that like all I really want to do is go out and make work. Like if I had it really, that's like I just that's what I'd like to do is go out and find an unexpected thing. And so that kind of leads me into a, a, a weird discussion of like the part of the work that's about really, really, really controlling and deciding what it means in the world and just absolutely um, having it be like 
um, irredeemably final. I'm not, I've never been that good at that. You know, sometimes when it's a book and a show at the same time, like, yes, it really makes sense. But like this New Antiquity book is very, in a way, it could have been 10 books, or it could have been 100 more pages or something. It really is fluid. That, I think means I'm not a good artist. Why? Yeah, what does that even mean to be an artist? Why are you not an artist? Um, <coughs> uh, because I'm a lot more interested in making the things I am. And you know, the other day I had a student that was like, I don't know if this is art. She had made this kind of like letter to her friend, and it was like a kind of male art thing with lots of cut out things, and it looked like almost something you do in high school with like lots of scribbling on it. And and I was like, well, it. There is an actual definition of what makes something art. Like we know what that is. That's been proven by the art philosophers. And huh? <laughs> yeah, it's art if you say that it's art. <laughs> no, seriously, right? Yeah. There's a Brillo box, and you painted and made a Brillo box, and it looks just like a Brillo box. <laughs> but you said that you made this Brillo box, and it's art, and it's art. And I just feel like that part of it, the part that's like absolutely resigned toward knowing exactly what this work is is a big part of being an artist. Not the part that like the dream that dreams of making things and loves making things. That might not be the artist somehow. Or the, those people those, those two figures are in collaboration with each other somehow. But I like the other guy better. I'm better at the other guy. I'm also not good at doing my taxes and paying my bills. So like that seems part of that other part, a little bit like management. I'm a manager. What's your sign? It's the uh, line segment. It's my favorite constellation, the line segment. Have you ever seen that one? I feel point is one of my other favorites. The chain. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, could you talk a little bit more about shifting to the digital? And uh, aside from moving into video, has that changed the way you you your thinking process or your working process? Sure. I have made um, thousands and thousands of bad <laughs> photographs <laughs> the last year. Literally, literally <laughs> thousands and thousands of terrible photographs. And maybe no good ones. Um, yeah, I don't know why exactly that is. It might just be that particular camera, or it just might be that I need the gravity and the pressure of having a limited amount. I always think about it like when you go in therapy and you're like thinking, I can't believe I'm paying a hundred dollars an hour for this bullshit. But you kind of know that it's on some level. But eventually, you learn that it's only the paying the hundred dollars an hour that makes it work, because that helps you to. It helps to force the gravity into the room to force the meaning into it. And it's the same thing. I mean, it might be the same thing with me with film. Just like, I only have 20 of these today. I better make them really, really good. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't know. I might just be the, I don't have the right camera yet. Uh, I also think that like, I, I you know, I, um, it might have just coincided with some like really weird, you know, experimental period in my life where I'm not just trying to, might have really opened me up to this I don't know. I, I think for the most part it's a disaster. And that's because the editing part is the hardest part already of being a photographer. It's the, it's the part that we can't teach them. them. You know, we can't teach people to edit. That's why, like, you know, m a lot of the great works of literature wouldn't have existed without editors, great editors, like The Wasteland. T.S. Eliot wrote this terrible, awful, lugubrious, awful poem. And Ezra Pound cut it down to a tenth of its size and made it to a great work of art. So that's the big problem with digital is editing. Just like, what? Look at all this stuff. It's impossible to even look at it. The other thing I don't like about it is that photography has gone from being a blue collar job to being a white collar job. Mm -hmm. It used to be like, you know, I know I have to go like in the dark room and I got to make all these prints, but like it's kind of like, it's just work. I'm on my feet all day. And 
and I just have to work. And just and it felt good the way work feels at the end of the day. But now it's like you're sitting around the computer all day, and the emails are coming in, and so you're like distracted. You're doing all this other business, and it's just ugh. So, on the other hand, you know, I don't know. great photographs are will be great photographs one way or the other. I don't, I don't, I don't really understand it yet. What do you think about it? Well, there's so much beauty in the photographs that you take with your phone camera. Um, so I'm, um, and the videos are something different. Um, they're beautiful moments in the midst of a, a different process. Yeah. Um, so it made me curious how it was affecting me. But the so video that, thing, especially with this Canon Mark II, is like gorgeous. It looks like 35 millimeter film. Beautiful, and I just shot this stuff in Vietnam. That is like gorgeous. It's really beautiful. I'm really excited about it. But I didn't have anything to really show you today. Um, so I do think the video potential of it is really the <coughs> part that I'm not certain about. Yeah. 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 I can't see anybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I just wanted to ask about. Um, your approach to photographs in terms of lighting. You said that you don't ever use light at all. You only use I've the never light. used a flash oh. or a hot light. Is there a reason exactly other than like Because like I also don't really like see flash and I also mm -hmm. talked about the fact that I don't know how you know, try to make this thing work. But your approach or like my feeling is that the light is part of the meaning, if, especially if it's put there by somebody else. And so, earthquake. Did you guys all read that the day got shorter the other day? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. It's like an excuse for not doing, getting your work done. The day is shorter. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. For me, the lighting is usually part of the meaning of the picture. Like it's there, it's legible, <coughs> somebody put it there. And so I'm criticizing it on some level. And also making use of it. You know, it might just be, I'm not opposed to it. I do have this, you know, I do notice that the studio lighting, the thing with the studio with the lights, that's the thing that every artist that isn't a photographer defaults into. Like the minute you're, I call them AWUPs, you know, artists who use photography. Like the minute you are hiring somebody else to make your photographs that for your art project, you always go in the studio and set up to like some fancy lighting. And that makes me suspicious in a way. I can't tell like really like, I always feel like you gotta earn it. Like with uh, Abaddon, I was like really? Like every time with the white background, with the lights, like really? And you never ever wanna do it any other way? You did do it in the beginning in other ways. It was great, you know. Nah, I wouldn't have it very good, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Questions? I think we should probably and wrap up, scenes. and there's a Thank you. reception outside, so, yeah. so we can continue our